our second uh, Sense of Manetta Leader Series event. So before we get started, as usual, I have a few announcements, a few housekeeping items. Um, I want to first and foremost welcome our liaisons. We have our liaison institute this weekend, so I want to welcome him, them here to the event. Hello. If you could take a moment and put your phones on silent um, and put your laptops or any other electronic devices away. I'll be putting mine away as soon as I get done. With my <laughs> um, as uh, always, please remain quiet during the event. Your voices travel. Um, out of respect of everyone in the room, uh, we want to make sure that everyone can hear, but also we want to make sure we don't distract our panelists as they're speaking. Um, if for any reason you do have to leave the room, remember there is no re-entry back into the auditorium. You will need to go to classroom four um, to watch the remainder of today's event. Um, at some point, our moderator will open up the floor for question and answer time. Um, there are two microphones over here in the aisles, so you will walk up to those podiums. Um, you will say your full name and make sure you say the name of your institution that you're representing. You have one question, keep it concise, Keep it open-ended so that way we can have a good discussion after you ask your question. And then lastly, once the event is over, remember, do not leave until Amanda gives you announcements uh, for the remainder of the day. Um, so as always, this is an event to cultivate a spirit of civil discourse, and we will continue that discussion with our topic, Congress in the Era of Trump, Politics and partner Partisanship in the House and Senate. I now welcome our faculty director for the SMLS series, Mr. Steve Scully. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We are thrilled to have a stellar panel. I, I first want to mention that if you are ever need a lifeline on who wants to be a millionaire, and it's a history or political science question, you want to have Tom Davis on the phone, because this guy knows everything about politics and history, and I think he won more trivia contests in Washington than anyone I know before. He's a graduate of Amherst College. He's a former member of the House of Representatives from Northern Virginia, a Republican. He had uh, the title of the chair of the National Republican Congressional Campaign Committee, and is a graduate of UVA Law School. He left the U.S. House in 2008. His colleague in the House at the time was Albert Wynn, a Democrat from Maryland. He's a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh and Georgetown Law School. I should point out, Tom Davis is from North Dakota originally, and uh, Al Wynn is originally from Philadelphia, but represented Maryland from 1995 until 2003 in the House of Representatives. We want to welcome Heather Cable of Politico. She is Roll Tide, a native of Alabama and the University of Alabama, and covers Congress for Politico. And Manu Raju, who you see quite often on CNN, we're thrilled that he could be with us with all the breaking news today. Uh, before working at CNN, he worked at um, CQ and the Hill newspaper, and he's a graduate of the University of Wisconsin, a native of Illinois. Before we get started, how many are foreign exchange students? Just so our panel knows where you're from, just raise your hand. Perfect, so you can see a very diverse group. Um, understanding Congress in the age of Trump, and uh, Manu will talk about the news of the day because we asked the president to make a little bit of news today, and uh, he's obliging. <laughs> Explain after yesterday when the budget director said there is no way the president's going to veto this bill, it's a bipartisan agreement, the Speaker of the House goes down to the White House, cajoling him, says it's a done deal, and now we're hearing he may veto it, yeah, possibly. And, and that's what the president himself uh, said this morning on Twitter, he said that I'm considering vetoing this bill over his concerns about what uh, is not in the bill, dealing with immigration, dealing with uh, DACA, not enough money, in his view, for border security. Uh, but this is exactly the opposite of what all the White House officials were saying yesterday, that the President was supported. Mick Mulvaney, the White House Budget Director, said very clearly the President's going to sign this bill. Uh, Sarah Sanders issued a statement uh, on Wednesday saying that the President was supportive of this bill. Paul Ryan, yesterday in his press conference, uh, said that the president was supportive of the border security money that he's now objecting to in this tweet. Uh, what it really all shows is that nobody speaks for Trump but Trump. And that makes things uh, incredibly challenging for uh, running the government, for legislating, because members often are talking not directly to the president, they're talking to his representatives, they're talking to uh, senior White House officials, they're trying to get a sense on where the president is on something. But when the president changes his mind because he's upset about what he sees on, 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 on news coverage or his, he has a view that's much different than what his officials are saying, uh, people are at a loss of 
where where they can uh, agree with the president on and where they are uh, on some key, on some key issues and. We see that right now. We are just hours away from a possible government shutdown now. If the president were to veto it, we've got the third government shutdown of the year. Uh, that being said, there's still a belief. Uh, just moments ago, one senior White House official, Mark Short, uh, told one of my colleagues that they believe the president will sign the bill. But again, Trump speaks for Trump. So who knows what he's going to have to do at the end of the day. And Tom Davis, just saying, and I really miss being in the House of Representatives. I really wish I was part of the Republican leadership right now. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not. I mean, <laughs> first of all, see, I left Congress undefeated and unindicted. And I'm very proud of that. <laughs> and it was, it was getting bad. I look, if Trump is not the cause, he's a manifestation of the problem that's been brewing for a long, long time in terms of the polarization uh, in the United States. I think he'll sign it at the end of the day. But look, even under President Bush and President Obama, we would get things that we would, rec we would recommend to the President a veto, but they would never say definitively what they would, what they would do. Uh, the, the thing I think Trump makes up his own mind, and he's got a White House staff that uh, I'm not sure what the hierarchy is there, who speaks for him makes it sometimes difficult to deal, but he also likes to be out in front of the press. He likes to uh, you know, be the center of attention, and he certainly is now. We're talking about him, right, and what he did. But I think he signs it at the end of the day. Uh, Congressman Wayne, when you left the House in 2003, has it changed over the last decade? Oh, actually, 2008. 2008, I'm sorry. Um, yes, it has. Um, there was more compromise when I was there. I think most former members tend to say, that, oh, yeah, when we were there, we could, we could. well, it was better but it still was not satisfactory in my opinion. Um, the polarization had begun. Some people said it began with the Bork, and that may be, for you students, may be ancient history, but there was a big controversy over how a Republican Supreme Court uh, nominee was treated. He was treated badly. And that was the beginning of the, some people say, of the acrimony. The acrimony has continued during my tenure, and since, obviously, it's gotten worse, and it is definitely much more polarized, much more tribal, and not, and I think losing sight of, and this is probably the most important one, losing sight of the common good. It's more, I win, you lose. And so instead of compromising, which everybody gets 70% of what they want, people are more concerned with, well, I can't let him get a win. So he has to get nothing, and I have to get everything I want. So what happens now is everyone's in pursuit of the perfect at the expense of the good, as a result, you get nothing. You two work together. So, Tom Davis, how did that work dealing with uh, somebody from uh, across the border in Maryland, a Democrat, you're a Republican, and yet you had some common issues? Well, Al and I knew each other before we came to Congress. Uh, he was from Prince George's County, which is a, across the river from my county. Our district <coughs> has invited each other on the river. Uh, but our, our jurisdictions were very different. Our, our constituents were very, very different. I had the wealthiest uh, congressional district in the country. Uh, Al had a, a majority minority district over in Prince George's County, uh, and we represented different groups. But we, rec you know, I, I, when I talked to Al, I knew we represented, knew what he, what I expected him. I didn't expect him to change to be me. Uh, but we also knew each other, and we come up in local politics. So I was chairman of the county board in Fairfax. Al was in the state senate in Maryland, and uh, we were there to get things done uh, in those days. This was, of course, before this came in. Uh, and now the, the crap to content ratio coming over this is just really very high. What is that? Mean? The crap to content. <laughs> Look, you've got single party districts where most members, all they worry about is their primary voters, and primary voters are a pretty thin ideological slice of the electoral pie. You've got everybody tuning into the media they want to hear that validates their worldview so they don't get exposed to other points of view. Uh, and of course, uh, Al and I can talk about campaign finance, where the money's moved from the parties out to the right and to the left. But these three factors together have just caused a, a polarization and a distortion of truth. And it makes, a, it, makes it hard, even when you want to get to an agreement, uh, to cover your back with your primary voters, it makes it hard to come. You teed up perfectly what I want to ask Kevin Hagel about, because we're seeing one of the fundamental core reasons why we have this dysfunction is gerrymandering, the way congressional districts are drawn, Explain what we saw in Pennsylvania and how that could be a barometer for the midterm elections and also maybe a change in the way congressional districts are drawn in other other states. 
So uh, Pennsylvania is really interesting. It's actually one of the most gerrymandered states in the country. Uh, some of the, <laughs> the districts were drawn in ways that look like shapes that you've never seen before. Um, so basically, the Supreme Court in the state overturned the gerrymandered districts and put in districts that are supposed to be more fair and representative of the state and better drawn. And what that means is in the midterms, it gives Democrats an opportunity to pick up uh, anywhere between three to five more seats than they would have picked up in the state because it's not just all Republicans in one district, all Democrats in another district. And so that's interesting because a lot of people think that Democrats are looking at the cusp of a wave and may be able to take back the House. They need to pick up at least 24 seats. And so if you pick up five or six seats in a state like Pennsylvania, that goes a long way. Tom Davis. So let me, let, let me comment on redistricting. I've been a campaign uh, chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, the major culprit in these single-party districts is not gerrymandering. It's what we call residential sorting patterns. It's the fact that people who think alike live in like-minded enclaves. If you tried to draw a Republican legislative district inside the Beltway or in Prince Rupert's County, you couldn't find enough Republicans to do it, right? They, they, Democrats are stacked on top of each other in cities in terms of the way they vote. They, they want to take a majority, but they do the massive redistribution program and, and, and redistribute people because they're stacked on top of each other to begin with. In Pennsylvania, what happened is you, you have two rules when you draw districts. One is they have to be equal in population. That's Baker versus Carr, Reynolds versus Sims, Supreme Court decisions. And secondly, you have to adhere to the Voting Rights Act, uh, which says basically you can't discriminate against minorities in, in drawing lines. That's the only rules. Uh, you know, being a, a competitive district is not in the Constitution because the Constitution didn't envision parties uh, for whatever it's worth. And of course, politicians who draw these lines are going to they're going to keep drawing them to their advantage and contort them any which way until somebody says stop. And now that's before the Supreme Court. But in Pennsylvania, it's different because in Pennsylvania. The Supreme Court is elected by the voters, and you had the Republicans in the legislature and the governorship control the redistricting process and drew the lines to, to their advantage, just like in Maryland, the Democrats did uh, to their advantage. Uh, but then in the Supreme Court, when the Democrats took control of the Supreme Court, and one of them actually ran on this, we're going to overturn the Republican redistricting. So they basically changed a Republican model uh, for a Democratic model depending who drew the lines, and that's the way politics has, has traditionally worked, and the courts have been hesitant to enter that. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court made it a state court decision, which kept the U.S. Supreme Court out of it, but there are two cases before the U.S. Supreme Court now, one on the Maryland congressional districts uh, and one on the Wisconsin legislative districts that they face. But, but to, to, let's not over, I, I get nervous when everybody says it's all gerrymandered. We have a lot of single party seats because of residential sorting patterns. I agree with that to a point. There are districts where you could have more objective redistricting. I favor redistricting by independent uh, commissions as opposed to by the legislature, because the legislature is always going to attempt to maximize its advantage. And while what Tom was talking about is certainly true in urban areas, Democrats are clearly stacked, and in rural areas, Republicans tend to be more stacked. But you've got broad segments of suburban areas where there's a pretty interesting mix, and what she referred to those strange shapes are because map makers from the parties get in there and they cut out communities and towns and small cities just to make sure the right party is clumped together to create a district. So it is not a panacea in terms of redistricting, but redistricting could create a lot more purple districts and more purple districts would result in, I think, more balanced representation. Well, let, me, let me make one other point, and that is, uh, in, in about 80 percent of these districts, the only race that counts is the primary. The general election is just a constitutional formality. So there's no question that the, the competitors has gone, gerrymandering is a part of it. I, I like you, I favor nonpartisan committees, just, just doing it based on other things. But there is no constitutional imperative that, that districts be competitive. Uh, there's nothing in there. We'll see what the court comes up with uh, this fall. But uh, nonpartisan commissions tend to be, I think, fair and not take the voters out of the equation in November. Which is my follow-up to Mono and also to Heather. If the biggest concern is the primary, what's the incentive for liberal Democrats or conservative Republicans to cross the aisle and compromise? Well, it's getting harder and harder. I mean, you're seeing uh, both in the House, uh, in particular, the middle evaporate. You're not seeing, there used to be a pretty healthy blue dog 
uh, caucus within the House, the Democratic caucus, when uh, these two congressmen were serving, clearly was much more significant uh, in strength than we're seeing today. Now that centrist group in, in, among the House Democrats is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And similarly, uh, on the House Republican conference, uh, you're seeing the faction in the far right of the conference getting more and more influential. Uh, the House Freedom Caucus uh, didn't exist uh, several years ago. Uh, the Republican Study Committee was the conservative group within the House Republican Conference. Now the House Republican Study Committee is essentially the mainstream uh, group within the House Republican Conference. I mean, it seems like almost everybody is in the House Republican Study Committee. And what, what formed after that was the Freedom Caucus, which became the far right, uh, further right than the Republican Study Committee. And they clearly uh, have made it life a little bit more difficult, a lot more difficult, uh, for Republican leaders, or arguably uh, were, were responsible for helping uh, drive out uh, John Boehner from the speakership because he did not want to face uh, a vote of essentially no confidence uh, in his speakership, something that was going to be pushed by the uh, Freedom Caucus. Uh, so those groups on each side have made it a lot harder uh, for uh, the leaders to come together. And then, you know, you're seeing a similar dynamic in the Senate. Uh, fewer and fewer, um, uh, there aren't that many moderate, true moderate uh, Republicans uh, in the Senate. Uh, and there are also a small number of moderate Democrats, conservative Democrats. And those uh, conservative Democrats, several of them have very difficult re-election races this fall in West Virginia, in North Dakota, Indiana, Missouri. Uh, so in those so the members, they may lose, they may hang on. If they lose, uh, then you lose even more of those moderates. So that does make it a lot harder uh, to come together, just given the makeup of the different conferences. Heather, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, you know, I think everything that he said is true. What's really interesting that you guys don't really get an opportunity to see, but we see, and you would know this from being in Congress, is that there's still a lot of camaraderie behind the scenes. Um, it doesn't really matter in some ways if you're Democrat or Republican, if you make friends, you have things in common, you know. A lot of times they'll come out in the speaker's lobby, which is where the House members come and they can talk to reporters and we can ask them questions. And for instance, just a couple of weeks ago, Mark Meadows, who's the chairman of the House Freedom Caucus, and Jerry Connolly, who is a Democrat from Northern Virginia, were out there and they put their arms around each other and were laughing it up and telling us a story, you know. And so that's a lot that you see behind the scenes that obviously doesn't play out in the press conferences or on the floor or when they're trying to push through these bills. Um, the other thing I want to say is I think that at least at the leadership level, the unpredictability of President Trump has kind of united uh, leadership on both sides, especially not when they're doing something like the GOP tax bill, which was obviously very partisan, but when they're doing something like this big deal to fund the government through the end of the year, they know that Trump is unpredictable, and they do kind of work together behind the scenes to do something that both sides agree with and that they can present to the president and try to get through Congress because, like we saw today, there's no guarantee that he'll sign this bill. So his unpredictability has helped kind of bring them a little bit more together, I would say. Tom Davis, and, uh, and he said, you know, the job I really wanted was Speaker of the House. I never intended to be President of the United States. That used to be the job everyone wanted, and now Paul Ryan reluctantly took the position and as a student of history, Tom Davis, you know that the last Speaker of the House to leave voluntarily was Tip O'Neill. Everyone since then was either forced out, lost the election, or lost the majority. What has changed with the role of the House Speaker? Well, the House Speaker is the political leader of the majority party. I think we have to understand that. And uh, with that, uh, as the fortunes of the party go, so go the fortunes of the Speaker. The problem both for him and for Nancy Pelosi, should the Democrats take the House, is their caucuses are fractionated. Um, a number of Democrats in the House who are there now refused to vote for her for speaker last time. Uh, and um, one of them, Lipinski, they went after a primary on Tuesday, didn't get him. Um, but there were a number of others that didn't. A, a number of Republicans didn't vote for Ryan. Connor Lynn says he won't vote for Nancy Pelosi. Oh, I think if you're in a marginal seat, Nancy Pelosi's numbers are, what you say, politics upside down, and it's not helpful to make this a referendum on who controls the House. If you're in a Republican district and you're a Democrat, you don't want to make your election a vote on who controls the House. You lose that race. You want to make it about you. So you take her off the table. Likewise, I, in my district, I could never have Newt Gingrich or Tom DeLay come into my district. There weren't many leaders I would bring into my district. I wanted to be Tom Davis, who brought in the Woodrow Wilson Bridge and got rail to Dulles 
uh, and was looking after my federal employees and contractors and ethnic groups. Uh, all politics used to be local. Unfortunately, now it's, it, they've done away with their markets. It, it, it's very uh, nationalized. But should the Democrats win the House, Pelosi has a problem. I don't think winning the majority in her caucus, but getting all those members to vote for her on the floor. And we're in a new era. Again, I, I point to this. You know, if Rachel Maddow or Sean Hannity don't like it, they incite a lot of people uh, and get them moving. I'll, I was on the floor when uh, Boehner was up, and they had, I think, 18 votes against him in the Republican conference. And one of the members said, I, he said, I had a thousand calls in my office today saying, vote for Louis Gohmert. And he said, these people I know have never met Louis Gohmert, or they wouldn't be calling me on this. Uh, but that was what, he said it was Louis Gohmert. Yeah, but that was, that was Fox News, and that was talk radio playing up to, to try to get with Boehner, who they felt was too establishment, because he was compromising and making deals with Democrats. Congressman Wayne. You know, it's really interesting. I think I agree with most of what Tom said, but I think much of the problem that speakers have, much of the dysfunction in Congress, we brought on ourselves through reform. Reform has done more damage to the operations and functioning of Congress, I think, than anything else. I'll start with money. It used to be money flowed primarily into the party apparatus. The party apparatus was a tempering institution, tempering against extremes. With the, I don't know if many of you young people remember, but it was McCain Feingold. That was a great reform that was going to move money away from the parties and back out into the, the community, so to speak. Well, what it did was it took away the money the party could use to back members who might be willing to compromise, protect them, so to speak. Instead, the money began to flow following McCain Feingold that was Citizens United which then magnified the role of outside interests. The outside interests now had the money that the parties used to get. They used that to move, they didn't use it to move to the extreme, but they were taking extreme positions that they were now better financed. And as a result, you had a lot more pressure, and you have a lot more pressure coming from the outside screen because they are now much better funded. Reform number two, get rid of earmarks. Well, the press, some of the liberal media and the conservative media all thought that this was the worst thing in the world. It was less than 1% of total federal spending. It was basically spending that members could direct within their district. I called it the grease that made Congress work. If you want a member to give, if you're the speaker, if you want a member to give you a vote, you reminded him that there's a bridge or there's a, there's a school project or a museum or something that he wanted in his district by way of earmarks, and if he worked with you, you'd help him get that particular project. If he didn't give you the vote, well, not so much. As a result, the speaker had, I don't want to call it a weapon, but he had a tool that he could use to help round up votes. He had greased the, to grease the machinery. That was lost in the great reform of eliminating earmarks. There were some abuses, but they could have been corrected through greater transparency, just make the public aware of which earmarks were basically boondoggles as opposed to those which were very worthwhile. So those two factors created uh, a much weaker Congress, a much weaker uh, speaker, leadership, and on the outside you had much more powerful special interests. And they drive the debate, and they preclude in many instances compromise, because what a member might consider to be a reasonable compromise, the, it, the uh, activists will tell you that's a sellout. And if you vote for that sellout compromise, we're going to run against you in the primary that he just talked about, which is where most elections are decided. And so members are cowed, effectively, uh, to follow the dictates of many of the outside activist groups rather than make reasonable compromises. Excellent point. I, I completely agree with that. I was just going to just to feed off that. One of the things that to point out is that it's very difficult to get things through Congress. It's very difficult if you're a, a freshman member of the House, chances are you're, you know, especially if you're in the minority party, uh, you're not involved in any major negotiations over a bill of a significant magnitude. And given the way that the Congress is now divided, it requires a lot of support to get your name on something, to have an accomplishment uh, to go back home in town. And that means for freshmen, or, or members in their second or third, for even senior members, it's very difficult to get legislation through. And the elimination of earmarks, as the congressman said, 
Uh, now, Rob's, a lot of these members, can go back home and point to specific things that they were able to accomplish. So now if you don't have earmarks that are you're getting uh, uh, accomplished, and you can't get bills through given the polarization of Congress, and just how difficult it is to get anything a significant magnitude, a lot of these members go, oh, they got nothing. Um, and and it, they got the party label, but it. they got the party label, and so then you know, it changes how the campaigns are run. It changes how these guys have to win re-election, um, and it uh, and it also leads to a lot of retirements. And we're seeing a significant amount of retirements from members, uh, even some on their, after their first or second term, because they're just not getting as much done as they perhaps thought they would. Hey, Tom, it's how many forty retirements this year, or is it even higher than that? Uh, yeah, it's 33 Republicans, and uh, yeah, it's over, it's over 40. Yeah. And Heather, you cover Capitol Hill for Politico and Political.com. Is it, this is a two-part question. Is it a happy place for members of Congress? And in the age of Trump, where, as I joke, that, you know, staffers have a shorter shelf life than a loaf of bread, what is it like to cover Congress when we see everything happening down the street on Pennsylvania Avenue? I would say it's, uh, I've been, so I've been on the Hill since 2012, and I would say it's a much less happy place now. You see a lot of Republicans who are also, they don't say it publicly, but they don't like the tweets, they don't like the chaos, you know, they don't like the instability and things like that, and that's why you have seen a lot of members who have, are in safe seats or wouldn't face particularly tough re-elections in other um, cycles and are like, you know, it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it to keep doing it under this president. Um, and a lot of them still don't feel like they can say that publicly, but they will tell us privately. I mean, they take out their phones too and they're like, he just said what? <laughs> you know, so everyone is caught off guard. I will say it has made covering Congress uh, very interesting. So the thing about like... <laughs> Look at Manu's eyes. <laughs> well, like, who can attest to this? They're, they're, a lot of the same stuff happens every every you know Congress. It's just sometimes different characters, sometimes not. You know, there's always the threat of a government shutdown. There's always like, are we going to get this uh, funding bill through? Things like that. So having Trump in the White House has made it very unpredictable for us as reporters. And in some ways, you wake up on Friday morning and you expect like a calm morning, and we're going to come to this panel, and then he threatens to veto the bill, and you know our whole day is screwed up. But in other ways, it makes your job much more exciting because you are always kept on your toes and you really don't know what's coming next. Yeah, that's 100% true. I mean, one of the overriding dynamics of this Congress has been how the Republicans have tried to essentially ignore, compartmentalize, and just try to like pretend like Trump doesn't exist in a lot of ways. Um, saying, oh yeah, I'm not paying attention to his tweets. Oh, I don't really know what's going on with the whole Stormy Daniels thing. Oh, what about the Bob Mueller? But, oh, Bob Mueller's investigating that. Oh, the president said that. Oh, I'm not really paying attention. I'm just focused on my job. Uh, the, the goal of, and it's been a dynamic that's been fascinating to cover because the, the Republicans are trying to understand how they can govern and work with the president of their own party uh, who is, to say the least, unconventional uh, and breathes on a daily basis, it seems like chaos is coming out of the West Wing when they're trying to get something accomplished. They're, what they're trying to focus on is legislative things that unite their party, that perhaps you know may get drowned out by the, the noise coming out of the White House. They've they got, they got a Supreme Court uh, pick, they got they've limited regulations, they, uh, pass the major tax law uh, and hope that that the president's the, the, the chaos does not overwhelm all the uh, things that they believe are good for their conservative viewpoints. Uh, the problem is that they believe that they can hold the house and they hope that they can potentially hold the house by selling the tax law effectively, but it's hard to sell something effectively when the person with the biggest microphone, megaphone, is saying and doing things and getting into so many different controversies on day in day out basis. So that's been the real frustration among the members on the Hill. Just how do you explain to the American public what they believe they're doing when the president is not on the same page with them at any given second of the day? And we have both of you respond, but just just think about the last five days. You have the Secretary of State who officially steps down, the firing of the National Security Advisor. 
the, you know, his, he says he wants to be with Robert Mueller, the threat of a government shutdown, a trade war with China, and oh, by the way, Karen McDougal on CNN last night, a Playboy Playmate, and Stormy Daniels, and all this other stuff happening leading up to November. So Tom Davis, we'll turn to you, and then Al Wynn. Well, I think the Republican frustration is is twofold. Uh, first of all, a lot of these guys got elected running against Obama. That was easy. He, was, he had his own set of problems. Republicans uh, had their highest performance levels since 1928 with Obama in the White House due to his unpopularity with a lot of groups. And that was easy, and now they have to defend the president. And that's always much, much tougher. Um, Trump is brought into the party a group of people that had never been Republicans before. They have stayed loyal to him, and what the Republicans are finding when they go back and poll their districts are the Republican base voters like Trump. And in primary voters, uh, they're not going to reward apostasy in people going against the president. So if the primary is basically what 80% of these members worry about the most, they have to worry about how they handle that issue. Uh, Jeff Flake told me 70% of his voters, primary voters in Arizona, the main issue was do you support Trump or not? And that's why he decided not to run. Now, of course, he's outspoken. He doesn't have to worry about the electoral risks. But there are electoral uh, risks in going after the president because he still has uh, a lot of support around the country, particularly among uh, Republican-based voters. Uh, uh, that's a fact. This didn't start with Donald Trump. It's been building up for years, a voter frustration uh, we talk about a trade war with China. I mean, if Hillary Clinton had been able to be true to where she'd been in the past and been free trade, this might have been a different election. But she was trying to out Trump Trump on the trade issue and denounce the TPP, which she'd supported before, and NAFTA, and all these kind of issues. So, I mean, I, I give the voters a lot of blame in this. I mean, you elect the you elect us. You blame <laughs> us. Well, politicians are not great leaders. We're great followers, man. And so, if the voters... <laughs> It's the truth. It's the truth. And, and if the voters are reacting to stuff, you'll see politicians try to jump to the, the head of the parade. Mm -hmm. And Trump saw something in the electorate that the mainstream media didn't do, of a group of people who had felt ignored for a long, long time, and he, he kindled a spark in them and was able to win the presidency. Now, in many ways, as a traditional Republican, it was kind of a hostile takeover of the party. But when you take a look at his regulatory policies and tax policies, they're more uh, in line. And let me just make one other thing. Uh, the president's been very slow to get his team on board. Less than a third of the appointees that he's entitled to are in office. Half of that's his fault because he can't find or vet people that get through the process that he can nominate. But the other half of the fault is the fact that the Senate is making them take 30 hours for each person. Uh, somebody did a calculation the other day that if the Senate continues to do this, it'll be nine years before he can get his appointees in place. Why do the Senate Democrats do that? Because they can, because it's the only tool they have uh, to show. And by the way, the Republicans did a lot of the same stuff to Obama. I don't know who started this, but it's so out of hand at this point. And it gets magnified, I think, because of the media is picking on Trump for every little, there are some legitimate things to go after him, as we argue that, from every little thing he does at this point. And people in the hinterlands take that personally, that you go after them as well. And his numbers are what they were on election day, for all practical purposes. Congressman, when is it two kids in a playground throwing sand at each other, these two political parties? You did this, I'm going to throw it back at you and back and forth? Well, I think that's true, and I think to a significant degree, Congress's failure to get things done, particularly during the Obama administration, gave rise to the climate that created Trump. We didn't really do a lot. We did uh, Obamacare, but after that, people have to start scratching their head to figure, well, what did we accomplish during those eight years? So that's one element. Congress was not terribly productive and did not address people's genuine concerns. I think there is going to be a Democratic wave in the midterms, and I think we are going to take back the House. But we have to be very careful because we can become, in the words of an economist, irrationally exuberant uh, and start believing that this is a slam dunk. It is not a slam dunk. Donald Trump's probably only away from one or two major issues and turn this whole thing around. What happens if he reaches a conclusion on North Korea that's reasonable? No one expected that. No one before had done it. If he goes to war with North Korea, the country's going to rally around the president times of war. So that could change the dynamic that seems very obviously in our, in our favor right now. The other thing is, Inside the Beltway, inside New York City, 
uh, bubble and the Boston bubble and the LA bubble, he's doing terribly. Outside of those bubbles, it's a very different story. When they start talking about the tax relief and the eight hundred or twelve hundred or fifteen hundred dollars that people see in their pocketbook. So the Democrats cannot overplay their hand simply because the echo chamber of our urban areas say he's the worst, the most loathsome president president ever because things can change. The third element is we still don't have an economic message. What are we telling the American people we're going to do? Democrats are actually split on trade because a lot of folks are not free traders on the Democratic side of the aisle. And when you look at the Midwest, there are a lot of people and a lot of unions that say, hey, yeah, that's right. Uh, we do, do need these, these tariffs. So again, some of the things that may seem obvious as you listen to the reporting, not necessarily so. And I think, uh, like, and I want to go back to some, this veto threat. That, that's the thing I'll, I'll shut up. This is interesting to me. Because what if he can force an immigration deal? If you remember, my premise is things could change. He said, okay, I'm going to veto the bill, the government's going to shut down. Well, of course, everyone's going to go crazy and lose their mind, but at the end of the day, they're going to have to come back to the table and negotiate over the immigration deal. And if they cut an immigration deal, which Bush failed to do, which Obama failed to do, but if he forces an immigration deal and then at the end of the day says, look, save DACA, go to walk, whatever, whatever, that creates a very different dynamic. So, as I say, I think Democrats are going to do well, but we have to be careful that we're not overly optimistic, particularly when we don't have a clear economic message to deliver to the voters right now. We want to engage in your questions, so get to the microphones, keep them brief, tell us where you're from. Heather and Manu, the most fundamental job of Congress is to pass a budget. A two-part question. Why not a two-year budget, Heather, and why is it so difficult? We went through four CRs until passage in the House and the Senate this week. Why, explain to the students why this is such a, uh, a, a big lift for members of Congress. Uh, well, partly because Congress is broken. Um, but I mean, the thing is, there are a lot of priorities that they have to sort through and a lot of deals behind the scenes that have to be made. And Congress doesn't really work well on, <clears throat> on anything unless they're facing a crisis or a deadline. And We've seen since September, they have gotten to this deadline, and they're like, you know what, it's easier just to keep status quo instead of answering some of these hard questions, like the immigration question that's come up since uh, Trump pulled the DACA program, which protects dreamers in September and things like that. And so for them, particularly as we get an election year, they don't want to take on the hard issues. I mean, this big bill that they passed that Trump is starting to veto, that's probably the last big thing that they'll do this year. And so, you know, I think it's just Congress, they have a hard time answering the difficult questions and when it's easier just to do what's already, just to keep in place what's already been done, that's what they do. And I would say that the, there are very few things that Congress absolutely must pass. pass spend, passing spending legislation, the Congress has to pass to keep the government open. The rest of the bills, they don't have to necessarily pass. You know, these are authorizing bills or things that, you know, you know, a wide range of issues are not required for passage. So what does that mean? That means that the spending bills become these Christmas trees, the things that everybody wants to attach every single priority uh, in a spending bill, and that significantly complicates uh, getting an appropriations bill through Congress. People push their, their ideological priorities, try to restrict funding in certain areas, and then, it, you know, then rather than making the hard decisions on keeping certain things out or trying to work together, uh, they punt on these difficult decisions until they absolutely have to make this decision like they had to do uh, last night um, to pass a, a gigantic spending bill that they unveiled, a 2,200-page spending bill that they unveiled on Thursday night. Nobody read. We voted on in the House Friday afternoon and the Senate Friday night. Nobody could have possibly have read every single page of that bill, but now is assuming President Trump signs it today, uh, it will become law. And it has everybody's priority in there, but they had to pass it because that was the one thing they had to do to avoid a shutdown. So the, the depth of the legislative process, in a lot of ways, uh, has led to the making it more complicated uh, to get the appropriations bills. And the, the two-year budget idea? Tom Davis? It was a good idea. Look, the government has only passed the appropriation bills on time for all. The, the fiscal year starts October 1. That's when the government's fiscal year starts. 
Um, the last time the Congress passed all of the called appropriation bills on time was 1996 for FY97. And we only did it that year out because we shut the government down twice a year before and we didn't even make up. Uh, it, it's, uh, I mean, it, it has been a dysfunctional process for years. A lot of state legislatures do biennial budgets and you come back and amend it in between, but at least you've got something. It makes a lot of sense. The appropriators fight it. They think they lose power, but it just Congress wastes so much time on this stuff they can't get anything else. I, I like the two year budget right here. This is a very uplifting conversation. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Mason Devers. I go to Austin Peay State University. Um, my question is mainly for the two former congressmen, um, and especially Mr. Davis. So, like we've talked about, a lot of uh, congressmen have decided to retire, and a lot of uh, chairmen for committees have decided to retire. Um, the GOP, they have a three-term limit on chairman. Is that something that you think we could, we should get rid of? Um, and if so, you know, why or why not? So, um, I left because I was termed out as a committee chairman. I had my three terms. I'm making 174000 in Congress. I knew I could make over a million dollars in the private sector. You pick. I mean, it, it's at that point, going and, and rotating back to a backbench after being a committee chairman and writing bills, it, isn't something I wanted to do in that environment. I, I just also had a personal basis. Uh, my district was changing underneath me. Uh, the, the party was moving right. My district was probably moving a little left. Uh, I was kind of in the middle of this. I was more moderate. Um, and so it was just the right time for me. Uh, and I ain't say, yeah, I prayed about it. Where was, was my right place? But I think a lot of members go through this. And for, for many members, uh, for, for a lot of members, it's the best job they'll ever have. And they're going to do anything to hang on to it. For a lot of the rest of us who made more and, and took a pay cut to come to Congress, it's, a, it's kind of an act of love. And when you see you're not going to be productive anymore, like, like being a committee chairman or this place is so dysfunctional, or I think in this case for Republicans candidly, they saw themselves probably going into the minority, uh, it's no fun. The, the minority in Congress does two things. Uh, they pick up their paycheck uh, and, and they make up the quorum. I mean, House is absolutely majority rule. Senate's very, very different. So I think it's that combination that has led to the number of uh, retirements. Thank you for the question. And by the way, great. They won't bring back. They won't bring back uh, the uh, abolishing three terms because every other member sees they're going to. They hang around long enough. They'll be a committee chairman. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Hi there, y'all. Uh, my name is Jake Paris, Stockton University of Political Science. Uh, my question is also for the two former congressmen. Uh, since 9-11, war powers have become gradually more and more concentrated within the executive branch. Uh, as you know, we've conducted extrajudicial assassinations of American citizens. Uh, folks, I'm asking a question here. Thank you. Um, we've conducted special forces raids around the world in West Africa, the Bosch one in Niger. Uh, we've enabled the Saudis to conduct an ongoing camp air campaign over Yemen that's killed over 10,000 people. My question for you two is, why has Congress completely failed in holding the president accountable in terms of war powers and national security? Al, wait, you want to take that? That's a very good question. I will give what I think is my perspective, but it's a, short, a relatively short answer. Congress does not want to have the responsibility or the blood on their hands. As long as the president's doing it, if it goes well, they say, yeah, we support it. If it goes bad, they can criticize him. But if Congress is in on it, as was the case with the Iraq war, then we are held responsible for the good or the bad. Classic example. Uh, I voted for the war in Iraq. Worst vote of my career. But it was my vote. Uh, and so I'm responsible for it. And that contributed in my primary election as one of the factors that came out. So Congress is not eager to have their hands all over. That's one element. The second element of it is that the executive has a lot more information than we do. In the case of the Iraq war, for example, I voted for them because they presented me with their intelligence, which was not very good, uh, but their intelligence supported the argument that there were weapons of mass destruction. Well, in other instances, they have intelligence that's not necessarily shared because it's not a major uh, in, uh, offensive, and we are not privy to that information, and therefore it makes it much more difficult for us to make or engage in an intelligent debate. I probably ought to stop there because that's really my take on, on why Congress doesn't get involved. Tom, we'll get I, money and then we'll go to Tom Davis. Okay. Okay. I was just going to say the parties are also very split on this. There was an effort in the Obama era uh, to authorize the use of force in Syria, and that created a huge fight within not just the Republicans who pushed back and what they did not believe that 
president should be doing this, there was a fight among the Republican revolt, but there was also among the Democrats too about exactly what an authorization of use of military force would look like. Uh, a lot of Democrats wanted to restrict uh, how much of this uh, air campaign could be carried out, others didn't want to go that far, so as a result, they punted, they didn't do anything about it. We'll see what happens uh, later in April, Bob Corker's committee, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, does plan to try to take up an authorization of use of military force, uh, the first one since uh, the Iraq War. Mm -hmm. But that would require, of course, them not just approving the committee, getting it to the House and Senate, getting the President to sign it. Who knows what that? Go ahead. Just, 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 just want to make a quick comment on, on specifically that decision. Obama took that to Congress because he knew Congress wasn't going to act. He didn't want to act because he drawn the line in the sand. It was clearly, okay, this is the line of sand. We've got to go for it. He could have. On every other instance, it, the executive president takes action. He did. He took the Congress. Why? Because it was clear in his mind, Congress was going to debate and talk to death and him and Hall, and nothing was going to happen, which is what happened. So he could not be blamed for initiating a war in Syria. Yeah, members don't like to own bad outcomes. I will tell you on the Iraq war, I also voted for it. Actually, we just voted to give the president authority. Remember, right. we were trying to get the weapons inspectors there. Right. And that way you want to you want to stand behind your president on something like that. And the war went fine. Especially post-9-11. Yes, exactly. Post-9-11. I mean, you know, it, but it wasn't just, I mean, the war was fine. It was the after war that they really screwed it up. Yeah. And, and uh, nobody wants ownership of that because you don't have any say in the conduct of the war. And, and I think Congress just got very gun-shy after that and said, it's yours. You, you think you ought to do it? Do it. And that's why. You just don't want to own bad outcomes. Heather Gagel, do you want to weigh in? Well, I mean, I think everything they said is absolutely right. <laughs> we've, we've seen the Syria debate divide Congress, not just in Obama years, but it's resurfaced in recent months. Um, Republican leadership in the House doesn't want to deal with it, even though their members and their own uh, conference tried to force the issue. And so it'll be really interesting to see what happens in Corker's committee uh, next month. I think that's kind of what we're all watching. Sure. And tell me, because I was your way, because it's an excellent point. It, it goes back to the, what we learn in civics. Are they co-equal branches of government? And, and here's the problem. The legislative branch is theoretically a co-equal branch of government, but what's happened is we have mutated into parliamentary behavior. Voters are now voting party, not person. Uh, all politics is local. That, uh, in general elections, that's out of the way, right? I mean, it, 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 it's, it's when they're voting party, not person, you see uh, more straight tickets voting than at any time in the last uh, 100, 100 years. And when members come to Congress now, they behave like it's a parliamentary system. The president's party in Congress is an appendage of the executive branch. They're protecting their quarterback uh, from investigations. Uh, they're trying to move his legislative proposal and work together. It's not an independent branch. And the, and the minority party in Congress, uh, they are no longer the minority party. They're the opposition party. They're no to everything. 74 filibusters this year on Trump nominees to, to get uh, uh, Trump nominees to just appoint a position. Some of them, uh, no, no flies on them at all, but just being, being a filibuster. In the last four administrations prior to that, there were only 34 total. Uh, it's, it's just a total breakdown, and it's a partisan mishmash. It's parliamentary behavior in a balance of powers government, and it doesn't work. Thank you for the question. We'll go over here. Thank you. Nice tie. Hi, my name is uh, Ryan Mash. I go to Bentley University, and my question is rolling around bipartisanship. Oftentimes, the rhetoric is very reminiscent, but um, at least in my recent memory, only overwhelming bipartisan actions have been regarding to either war, defense spending, financial deregulation, or there was a recent domestic spying program that was expanded because of overwhelming bipartisanship support. So my question is, should that be the goal that we work towards, or is are we more at a place where way legislation should be passed is the majority party kind of takes the lead in passing their legislation instead of working to compromise for this bipartisan legislation because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't remember a time in recent history where there's been an overwhelming bipartisan effort to do some sort of law or legislation that's core to issues prevalent to, like, common Americans. Thank you. Now, Mario, why don't we start with you? We'll just go down the row here with a comment. Yeah, I mean, I think you've seen it become very difficult to get to bills through uh, on a bipartisan basis unless there's a big deadline, like a fiscal crisis, uh, or um, you know something that they are forced to deal with. Uh, you mentioned the recent uh, deal that was cut in the Senate uh, to roll back some of the Dodd-Frank rules uh, because of 
the fact that the Democrats are split on that, the Republicans were able to pick off a handful of Democratic votes to get that through uh, the Senate. It has become a, a more difficult place to legislate. But look, you, you have to, the way that the system is set up, it requires to have to come some sort of consensus unless there are overwhelming majorities uh, in both parties and the White House. And even that's difficult, I mean, even to get things through. Uh, the Obama era, in the first two years, they had 60 votes in the Senate. They could overcome a filibuster if they stayed united uh, in the Senate. Uh, and that's how they got Obamacare through, a um, party line vote uh, in the Senate, uh, even though they, um, uh, even though it was incredibly difficult for them just to do it uh, out from one party. The system is set up that the Senate, you know, you need to get 60 votes to overcome a filibuster. Right now it's 51-49 in the Senate. They need nine Democrats. So there has to be uh, some level of bipartisanship, and that's one reason why uh, it's been so difficult to get things through besides uh, the very sick. So they have to do because they're facing crisis or a deadline uh, because there isn't that willingness to... The, the, the parties are so split on some core fundamental issues that there is a uh, little desire to do so. Heather? I think uh, another element of it is, especially in election years, the one party doesn't want to give the other party a win. I mean, when Democrats are looking ahead to November and they see their chances to take back the House, I mean, there's very little incentive for them to work with Republicans, even if the opportunity did present itself on a big bipartisan bill, other than the spending bill, because again, the government has to be funded. But because they don't, they want to go home and campaign on the fact that Republicans can't get anything done, put us in the House, put us in the Senate, and we'll get things done. So I think that that really contributes to a lot of the lack of bipartisanship that we see in midterm election years like this, particularly. Congressman Wayne? Well, I think what she said is absolutely correct about the wins and losses and denying the other party wins. My point is that bipartisanship is not an abstract idea. It's really essential as a unifying force. The reason why bipartisanship is good is just not it's bipartisan, but because it means that a broad cross-section has come together in support of an idea. Now you take Obamacare, one party rams it through, the other party hates it. Obamacare is not perfect, but there certainly, it certainly had merit, and if it had been bipartisan, you'd have had much more support across the country for it. Same thing with the Republican tax bill. You ran it through. It's not perfect, but it has some merit. Were it done on a bipartisan basis, it would have been a better bill and would have gotten more broad-based support. So bipartisanship is a national unifying concept, and if you can achieve it, you get a better product and you get more national support and less polarization. Skin of the game. The real, the real problem is the Senate. Uh, the House has over 300 bills they have passed, some of them with large bipartisan majorities that are part of the Senate, and they can't get floor time because somebody objects, and that means theoretically you've got to waste uh, two or three legislative days going through a uh, legislative filibuster on that, and that's been the holdup on this. Uh, also, I just add that bipartisan legislation tends to be lasting, uh, and, and partisan legislation gets rammed through, as we saw with health care, see the tax cut, the other side comes in and they just can't wait to, uh, to reveal it. In times of crisis, as, as I think was noted, um, Congress gets together. Uh, uh, so we got on the target issue, uh, the trouble asset relief program, you know, the economy spiraling down. It took us two votes in the House, uh, but in the, in the Senate came together. But in crisis, when both parties feel that their tails are on the line, uh, they will come together. But otherwise, a lot of this is red jerseys versus blue jerseys, and we don't want to give them a win, and we want to deny it. It happens to members, too. Members in vulnerable districts, uh, the other party doesn't want to give them a win. It, it's, 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 it's petty, but it's the way things work. And you both saw that after 9-11, because you were in the House. Uh, yes, go ahead, sir. Uh, By the way, Al and I worked on a lot of bills together. I mean, we, we, we worked on a lot of stuff together. We're from the same region. And, uh, I think we need to get back in Congress. What do you say? Yeah. 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 Stuff done. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Tom O'Connor from Bridgewater State University. I'm and sorry, we, 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 we missed the beginning. Go ahead. Uh, Thomas O'Connor from Bridgewater State University. My question is about gerrymandering. A lot of the focus attention on gerrymandering is the heavily gerrymandered states, such as Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Maryland, and Wisconsin. But Shouldn't the attention go to the states that are least gerrymandered and what we can learn from them and model from them? I think one of them is Iowa. Uh, Marla, do you want to take that in, Heather? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, that's 
certainly something to look at. Um, one other thing that, that when you mentioned that it came to mind was, and I, I'm curious what other people on the panel think too, uh, about the California system, uh, that there's no primary, or at least they would have jungle primary, which is you have um, the, everybody competing to get into the general election, and the top two vote getters get in the general election regardless of party. Uh, now, that doesn't really, doesn't solve all the problems. Um, it certainly doesn't deal with the districts. Uh, but that's one effort, one state trying to figure out whether or not to deal with um, the extreme partisanship that you often see in a lot of these house districts. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that was my initial thought. And Heather, you've been covering this topic in detail. you want to respond? I've been covering it in the sense of Pennsylvania a little bit, but um, yeah, no, I think it, it, it really, the topic of gerrymandering has really seen a resurgence, especially since President Obama left office and his former Attorney General decided, Eric Holder decided to put their, that's where they were going to focus their energy in trying to challenge these states that are very gerrymandered and, um, you know, get that overturned in an effort to make like a long-term impact on the House. And so that's something, it'll be interesting to see if uh, efforts like that really take hold and are successful. I think, you know, we've seen it in Pennsylvania, and like you guys mentioned earlier, there are other states that are under consideration by the courts. Um, so I think it's something to watch long-term. In the immediate future, you know, there's, other than Pennsylvania right now, there's little impact. Tom Davis? Again, there's no constitutional uh, uh, right to make, to make sure these are competitive districts. Legislatures are empowered that ally both by commissions, we think, uh, under current law, that, that, that works fair. It keeps voters in the game in November. I just know I won a district. I beat a Democratic incumbent that had drawn the district for herself. And I beat her in that district, and I held it four times. Uh, when I came up for a redraw, my wife happened to be chairman of the committee of the state legislature between the lines, and I got a little bit better district. Uh, I didn't there, there was a lot of complaining about it, but I didn't make the rule. But, uh, but I would, you know, you, uh, all politics yeah. is local, so, so. or on the home front. Yeah, yeah, I think you can learn a lot. Three states have uh, have uh, uh, runoffs, and you run jungle primary, uh, where the top two could be two Republicans, two Democrats: Louisiana, Washington, and California. Uh, several states have commissions. Iowa has a unique way. I think we can learn a lot watching from that. So I think we've learned a lot. I think they've been relatively successful. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lizette Guadalupe Salomon. I'm from Mexico. I graduated in business. And my question is regarding the news from Cambridge Analytics and Trump's campaign. Just his uh, presidency has been like a roller coaster. Uh, his campaign itself, and now with this news, I'm just wondering what's next and what's the what's the opinion from a Congress and reporters too. Oh, well, you're shaking your head. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, the, the Cambridge Analytica story is a uh, a significant one, and it's one that has is still not fully told. I and mean, we know the full nature of it is, of course, the data firm, the Trump campaign employee in 2016. We now learn that that firm uh, access the user information from 50 million Facebook users. Uh, the company, Facebook, says it was done improperly. Uh, the head of that company, Alexander Nix, uh, also um, now been suspended. He's someone who's gotten uh, a lot of uh, attention uh, because of his efforts to try to reach out to WikiLeaks during the campaign and access uh, the hacked emails that uh, the Russians were behind and you know, Steve Bannon was also part of Cambridge Analytica, and they were, uh, Eric not part of them, but he helped with their data operation. And, well, he, and also the Mercer family, which pays Republican donors, uh, to help bankroll that organization. So where does this go? I don't know. Uh, what we do know is um, that it's the special counsel, Robert Mueller's investigation, clearly interested in this. We do know there's people from Came in general, that we met with the special counsel. Um, what at least one of those officials also has met with the House Intelligence Committee, but their Russia investigation is now over. However, the Democrats in the House Intelligence Committee are pushing forward, and they have gotten assistance from one of the whistleblowers at Cambridge General to provide them information and testimony. And 
you're hearing also members of Congress want to hear publicly from Mark Zuckerberg uh, about exactly how Facebook dealt with this. Um, so on that specific aspect, of, I mean, this this is a, an area of this Russia investigation, the investigation more, more broadly that we didn't really see um, uh, just a couple weeks ago, but now it's a very significant, potentially significant part of it. And it just speaks to the larger story about the Russia investigation in general is that there are there, there consistently been drips and new developments that have led to weeks and weeks and weeks of stories. And that's also been very distracting for this White House and of a frustration, clearly, to this president uh, because it is uh, distracting from his message, distracting from what he uh, says he wants to accomplish. And they're having their own issues because the president yesterday fired his lead, or got rid of his lead counsel dealing with the Mueller investigation. Uh, and that's all news now. That's, that's, that's all news, right. exactly. We moved on. Exactly, and the president's going to have to meet with Rob, Robert Mueller. Uh, he may, and there's a lot of discussions about him having an interview with them, and you know, if you lie under oath, that's a big problem, and the president has a hard time oftentimes telling the truth. So this is, um, so there's, uh, there are a lot of, uh, there are, this is not over, this is what's one big reason why the president has been so frustrated. And maybe it's so unpredictable. Quickly, then we'll go to Trump Davis. How many of you have Facebook pages? And how many of you are on it on a daily basis? I, I want you to respond to what he said, Mon, uh, Mon, said Tom Davis, but also how big of a PR problem is this for Facebook? Is I, think it's a, I think it's a big problem for Facebook. Uh, but, I mean, uh, part of this is just a, a part of the left to discredit uh, President Trump's victory. Well, the Russians did it. They cheated on Facebook. They did the fact is Hillary Clinton got more votes, but under our system, she didn't get more electoral votes, and she ran a bad campaign. And you know, get over it. I, I by the Bob Mueller was a law school classmate of mine. I trust his investigation. He's a straight up honest guy, and I'm going to let the investigation go wherever it goes, and I'm not going to lead any speculation on this. But I saw this before with Bush when he uh, won the vote as it went to the Supreme Court and tried to delegitimize uh, the presidency. The fact of the matter is, in our election last time, we had two of the most unpopular candidates in history running. And 17% of voters on election day didn't like either candidate, had an unfavorable opinion, both candidates. We had a lot more who had an unfavorable opinion, just didn't vote. Um, and, but Trump ran the tables on that because they wanted change. They wanted to go a different direction than President Obama had taken the country. That's the fact. They'll get a shot in the midterms. I suspect what Al said, that they will try to balance government instead of giving President Trump a blank check. I suspect the voters want to put a check on President Trump at this point. And the investigation goes where it goes. But a lot of this is just an effort to delegitimize the fact that he cheated and win everything. They ought to be asking, why didn't Hillary Clinton pay more attention to Wisconsin and Michigan, Midwestern states? Uh, you know, why is she up on the stage with Beyonce and Jay-Z and Philadelphia? Uh, on there and not paying attention to some of these working class people. And I, I think that's, you know, that's a, that's a strategic issue. The papers had already elected Hillary Clinton. You looked at the media and this stuff, they're just, uh, uh, they're swarming all over each other in praise, and they got shocked because they don't understand that a lot of people in this country uh, are alienated on both sides. And Trump tapped into that alienation uh, to them. Good point. We have time for me. Thank you all for coming out. My name is Brian Miller from Mississippi University. My question is kind of a general one on um, party polarization. How could we kind of reduce that and kind of get back to the idea of how bipartisan is supposed to work? Heather, from your standpoint, how would you answer that? Because you see it on the front lines covering Congress, and we'll have the two members respond. I mean, I think that the district makeup is a big part of that uh, in terms of polarization. If you elect members to Congress who uh, basically their districts are all Republican, then, you know, they have no reason, or Democrat, you know, depending, they have no reason to kind of move to the middle on anything. So I really... I think this is a long-term problem and gets part back to part of uh, the gerrymandering that we were talking about. It's not going to be solved overnight, but if you do get districts that are more representative of um, the general population in terms of you have a smattering of Republicans, you have a smattering of Democrats in your district, then you're more likely to move to the middle and try to compromise and work on things like that. Congressman Wayne? Well, I have a lot of faith in this audience because they're millennials. And reports I have seen indicate millennials are more likely to be independent. And I think that's a good thing. Because right now, the partyism, the tribalism is hurting us. So to the extent that the upcoming generation looks at things with a more objective view and is able to sort through uh, 
and make independent judgments, you can put pressure on candidates to take more reasonable positions. Or not. If you become you know, totally ideological and everything is red or blue, then you get a red and blue polarized Congress and a red and blue polarized country. So, you know, without being Pollyannish about this, I think it is really true that in a participatory democracy such as ours, the ability of people to go out and vote and express their views uh, and demand a certain amount of objectivity, balance, you know, bipartisan, whatever you want to call it, is ultimately what's going to decide. And Tom, this goes to your earlier point. Yeah, I mean, and also just, uh, we, we have a saying in politics, that liberals and conservatives have passion, moderates have lives. And the end result is, in the participation in primaries, we, we find the liberals dominate the Democratic Party, conservatives dominate the Republican Party, and a lot of independent people who don't like the choices, don't participate. Go to primaries, that's fine. fine. Follow the candidates, read both sides, don't just believe the stuff you get on Fox and MSNBC. Make up your vote in primaries. That's where the election is. You need to have some states open up the primaries so independents mm -hmm. can vote in primaries and not close primaries. Yeah, but, but even where they do, they don't, independents don't vote. Although, I agree with that. Some states prohibit the, the independents from voting in primaries. You have a book in you, hosted by Tom Davis. Yeah. <laughs> um, two more questions very quickly. Go ahead, keep it brief. Um, I just wanted to, oh, hello, my name is Mahali Bazil, I'm from Stockton University, I'm a communications major, and I just wanted to know a little bit about the relationship between gerrymandering and redlining, and if you would agree that there is a relationship, and how maybe gerrymandering can minimize a vote from one demographic than another. What do you mean by redlining? Oh. Redlining districts. You're talking about housing discrimination. Yeah, housing discrimination is where Denver, like groups of people are placed or was oh, back in. Yeah. Let, let me start off with, with this. There is redlining, and then there is something that Tom referred to, which is people liking to live next to people who think like them, maybe even look like them, behave like them, share values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Redlining is a problem, much less today than it was, say, 20 years ago when it was much more rigid. Uh, redlining does contribute to single demographic communities, but again, much less so than in, in my generation. Right now, gentrification may be a much greater uh, factor, in other words, that people of certain socioeconomic uh, levels are clumped together, and the interests are not necessarily based on race or religion, but are based on economic considerations. And if they're together, they're going to have a particularly uh, singular view of who ought to be elected. And it may not necessarily be someone who's really concerned about the poor mm -hmm. if you've got a very upscale demographic uh, cause as a result of housing patterns. Let, let me throw out a controversial comment here, but frankly, the Voting Rights Act is a contributor to that because that forces you to pack minorities into districts. And so in the Deep South states, all you have in the House of Representatives are white Republicans and black Democrats. And no need to talk to the other side because they play no role in the nomination process. Is this a good thing? Is this a good policy outcome for the country? Uh, when this came into being in 92, uh, when they revised the Voting Rights Act to mandate more, the biggest beneficiaries of the Voting Rights Act have been Republicans. Oh, no, I, I understand that. But it doesn't have to be that way, which goes back to something we both agree on, which independent commissions <coughs> can thwart some of that. I'm going to jump in two things. First of all, I'm going to give you the last question, but uh, Mondo Raj, who has to head over to CNN for a live hit, so you're all going to have a chance to answer this question, but I'm going to let you do it and then let you uh, skip out because I'm going to be on the air. <laughs> What one internship or job gave you the break that got you to where you are today at CNN? Is you could sit here in this audience 10, 12, 14 years ago, what did it take? Uh, I don't know if there was specifically one thing, uh, but you know, I think it was a series of things. You know, I first started in uh, journalism in my college newspaper at the University of Wisconsin. I was writing for my paper, and I, that's how I kind of got the interest uh, in journalism. And then I got talked to a couple of journalism internships at college and both working for a local NBC station there uh, in Madison and one in LA. And then I also then when I moved out to DC, I worked for various publications 
um, that led to my position here uh, at CNN. But one thing that I, I did do early in my career was that I tried to really get to set up some inter informational interviews and meetings with employers and editors and not get discouraged when people said, you know, I don't want to meet with you, I don't want to talk to you, I don't have time to talk to you, but to just be persistent and hopefully get on the radar of someone and get to know someone and then when the position opened up, you know, I would be under consideration and that helped me get uh, at least, I think, two of my jobs initially uh, by just getting to know some of the, uh, the editors at uh, publications by just being proactive initially getting on there with us. Persistence. Persistence, yes. We will let you go. Manu of CNN, formerly of CNN. Last question. Hi, my name is Andrew, and I'm from Westfield State University, criminal justice major. And I was wondering, what do you think about John Bolton? Like, Trump promised his supporters that he wasn't going to put John Bolton in as part of his administration, so I was shocked yesterday. Well, I think he's changed, you know, as he's walked in, you just see a different administration than when he walked in the door with. Bolton is respected on the right for what he has been in, in terms of his uh, experience, and he doesn't need Senate confirmation. So when you talk about making people part of your administration, a lot of times you, you defer to cabinet, sub-cabinet. This is a White House part that doesn't need Senate confirmation. I don't think Bolton could be confirmed to the Senate. What advice do you give Republicans running in this midterm election? You ran the Congressional Campaign Committee for the Republicans. Al Wynn, what advice do you get from Democrats? Um, Davis, well, I, I spoke to the Republican Conference. I've, I've done it a couple times. They've asked me to come back because I had a very successful tenure twice as, as campaign chairman. Um, and I think you want to try to personalize these districts. If you're in a Trump district, that's fine. You can run right along. But as, as was noted earlier, the only thing the party is giving you now because Congress is so nonproductive is the party label. And traditionally, when one party controls the House, the Senate, and the presidency, your midterm losses are pretty uh, pretty large. Uh, 1994, 2006, 2010. Uh, and this isn't just with President Trump. It was true with President Obama, it was true with President Bush, it was true with President Clinton. That once they controlled everything, the voters came back at it with a, with a vengeance. And I think this is the, the historical curse that the Republicans face this time. So what I did in my district in 2006, a Democratic wave year, is I did everything I could to personalize uh, the district. I was around talking to all my groups. Uh, in those days, we could produce uh, some legislative product. I had a successful legislative time. I do the hearings and the kinds of things you need to do, where even if the, my voters didn't like my party, they saw some redeeming qualities in me to keep me around. But without earmarks, that becomes harder. And for members that have only been there two or three terms, I've been there a few more terms, it was a little easier for me. Congressman Wynn. The Democrats are in a very favorable climate, and running this Trump is kind of a no-brainer. Uh, I think if you're in a, in a blue district running against Trump, it's fine. If you're in a purple district, you may have a little need for caution. And that is, we could nominate people who are too far to the extreme, and in a general election in a purple district, in a climate that we ought to succeed in, we could have an extreme candidate who fails to win, and a, a moderate Republican incumbent or a moderate Republican a challenger on the other side could succeed even though people hate, hate, hate Trump, because our nominee could be so far extreme, because remember, the most progressive wings of both parties are the ones that turn out in the primary, which is why Tom Bright, we need more independent minded people running, running in, uh, voting in, in primaries. The other thing is, Democrats, particularly, again, go to purple states. The blue states will take care of themselves. Blue districts take care of themselves. We need a better economic message. I do not believe we can run telling people we're for $15 an hour minimum wage. Yes, it's a good idea. Yes, we ought to do it. But no one is raising their child to earn $15 an hour. We're going to have to have an economic vision. We're going to have to talk about training for technical jobs, a new economy. We're going to have to talk about health care. We're going to have to talk about some substantive issues that people care about, not necessarily ideological issues. I think we ought to do immigration. I think we ought to take care of the, the, the DACA kids. But in a purple state, I wouldn't say that that's what Democrats ought to run on. They ought to run on pocketbook issues. Bill Clinton, well, actually, Jim, James Carville said it best. It's the economy, stupid. 
And so you always have to have pocketbook issues, so that would be the advice I'd give them. Have pocketbook issues uh, so that when you get to the general election, you've got something to talk about other than Trump. And, and final point for you, what would a divided government, if, if the trend continues, if the Democrats gain back the House and or the Senate, what will it look like in January of next year, Heather? Hold on. If Democrats went back to House and Senate? And or the Senate, yes. Uh, it'll be really interesting because they'll have a big microphone to take on Trump, something that they have, you know, you struggle with in the minority. Um, I think that the big question on Capitol Hill, especially if Democrats went back to House, is will they pursue impeachment? And that's something that they have definitely tried to delicately dance around because in these moderate districts, you don't want to alienate... Um, independent voters or Republican-leaning voters who may be turned off by Democrats' whole message being impeachment, but it also does rile up the base. And it's definitely something that Democratic leadership has struggled with because their members have pushed the issue on the floor in a couple of votes, and it's something that they don't want to stand up and have to answer at press conferences. So I think post-November, if they do take back the House and the Senate, that's a big question that uh, reporters will be looking for them to answer at least. <laughs> Final question for all of you. What job, what decision, what internship early in your career propelled you, in your case, to Politico and to both of you gentlemen to the House of Representatives? Tom Davis, let's start with you. So I got an appointment as a page in the Senate in high school. So from ninth grade to twelfth grade, I got up, went to school from six to ten every morning and then worked in the Senate. Uh, at Amherst, one of my classmates was David Eisenhower, whose father in law was president of the United States, so I had an internship at the White House. And then in law school, I interned for uh, one of the legislators, started managing campaigns, and working on campaigns, you figure out, you're as good as these guys you're working for, you can do it. So that's what started me. <laughs> and, and 29 ran for office and kept landing. I had an internship at the State Department, and uh, that basically opened my eyes and kind of gave me exposure to a much larger world. I come from a very parochial community, suburban community, and African-American community. Folks didn't think a lot about running for political office. Work in the State Department, open my eyes, and I was able to that combined with a certain amount of ambition. Because like Tom, at a point you look around and say, I can do as good a job as these guys. I think I'm a runner. <laughs> and Heather, for you? I would say if you're interested in journalism, I cannot stress enough working on your college newspaper. Uh, that's where I started. That's where you cut your teeth. You get an idea of how to write a story. And if you know how to write a story, you can write any kind of story. It doesn't matter if you're on Capitol Hill or in Omaha, Nebraska. So. The other thing, um, in journalism, especially here, there is no job that is too small. You want to get your foot in the door and then try to work as hard as you can. And my example for that is I really wanted to cover Congress and I wanted to be on Politico's Congress team. And there was a newsletter that Politico does called Huddle. And it comes out every morning at 8 a.m., which means that you get up at 4 a.m. and write it. And there were a lot of people who also wanted to be on Congress team but did not want to get up at 4 a.m. and write this newsletter. And I said, you know what, I'll do it. And on top of that, I'm also going to write other stories about House Democrats because no one was paying attention to them right after Trump won. And so, you know, if the hours were long and some days it was like, you know, I was really exhausted. But eventually you get off the newsletter and you're covering a beat that no one has paid attention to for several months and now they're on the cusp of taking back the House and you put yourself in a prime position. So my point is something may not look attractive in the moment, but if you see it as a way to get your foot in the door, take it and work as hard as you can. Final thoughts from any of you. Tom Davis, did we miss anything? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to say the new governance model uh, is basically uh, having the executive branch in the Senate because Congress has been so nonproductive uh, that it, 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 even on the budget issues, nothing's going through. So all the initiatives President Obama gave up on the Congress once the Republicans took the House, and you started seeing DACA. All these things were by executive order and, and, and regulation, and that's how he started running things. Uh, now President Trump is doing the same thing. They got a tax bill but through, they're dismantling the health care bill through the 1,300 regulations that they've got to do at the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. But a lot of the Obama initiatives and more are being erased uh, with the pen because they were done by the pen. And now you see the fight leading to the courts. And you see the big fight going uh, over who controls the Supreme Court and the circuit courts. I think mean, a couple weeks ago all the Senate did was confirm four appellate court uh, uh, nominees of Trump's. And he's going to repack the courts after Obama packed them the other way. That's kind of where the uh, where the uh, where the area has moved to now in, in politics, as Congress does not operate as an independent branch, 
but as an appendage of the uh, uh, president's party. <coughs> Can I just point out that we've gone through this whole conversation without any jive, so UMBC beating UVA in the uh, first round of the NCAA. Well, until now. <laughs> now when? The most embarrassing uh, oh. loss in, in NCAA. Unbelievable. Anyhow. Uh, Look in somewhat different direction. I've got a concern about the decline of democracy worldwide. And if you look around, what you see is authoritarian governments, Russia, the Middle East, Asia, you name it, on the rise. No one's clamoring for democracy. No one is really championing democracy. And part of the problem is because democracy is messy, and democracy has not, in terms of Congress at least, been terribly productive. So no one's saying, hey, my life's being changed for the better because of democracy. That makes it hard to sell. I think that's another challenge that I would lay at the laps of millennials. I don't like to criticize millennials. I like to just give them jobs and take <laughs> tasks to, to do that we messed up. But I, I think that's a serious issue because we hold democracy very dear, but the rest of the world is not necessarily seeing the same thing that we see. And so we've got to get better at it, which means people have to set aside some of the ideological passion and start looking at some pragmatic results here in this country because that's why Trump rose because we had a lot of ideology, not a lot of pragmatic results for a huge swath of the country that wasn't really doing so well. We got to be cognizant of that and use that as an example of, of democracy. Otherwise, people say, eh, you're just as well under an authoritarian government as long as I've got a job. You don't want that. You get the last word, Heather. Thank you. Uh, one roll tie. I'm just going to put that out there one more time. Uh, <laughs> My team always wins, so that's great. Uh, and two, Ouch! <laughs> it's football, it's different, right? Um, and two, I would say you guys, to you guys, don't be afraid to use your voice and pay attention to what is happening on Capitol Hill. I know there are a lot of tweets and a lot of Snapchats and Instagram and Facebook. I have three younger siblings and I'm only 30, I'm not that old, so I, I understand. But what happens on the Hill may seem, you know, the legislative process may seem archaic, it may seem hard to understand, convoluted, but it does affect you and your voice does matter in this. So pay attention, please vote, please speak up. Check out her work at politico.com. Al Wynn, a Democrat from Maryland, Tom Davis, Republican from Virginia. A great, thoughtful, interesting panel. We learned a lot. Thank you.